Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for a virtual meeting with one of our live animals. And thank you so much for joining us. I see some more students and teachers are coming in. So we're gonna slowly get started and kind of introduce what we're going to do today. My name is Rachel and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. And uh, as you can tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home, like many of you are probably are right now. But we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help care for our living animals that call the museum home. You might be surprised to learn that we even have live animals at the museum, but we do have over a hundred different species of living animals that are in places like our nature lab, the new Bugtopia exhibit in the Discovery Center, and some that live behind the scenes, which you all are gonna get to see today. And as I mentioned, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about the animal on your own. If you'd like, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a writing utensil, like a pencil, so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any questions that you have, maybe a few facts that you've learned, or draw write a description of what the animal that we're going to see today looks like. So let's get started. I'm going to switch our camera over to Forrest and our animals, and you can get to meet our live animals today, and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Forrest. Hey, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Today, I'm back in the lab again to talk to you about animal hair. This is part one of a part, part one of a two part series. I'm going to go over invertebrate hair. And then the second part, Leslie's going to go over vertebrate hair, vertebrate hair. So <clears throat> first of all, right, we're mammals and a hallmark of being a mammal means that our bodies are covered in hair, right? I don't have as much hair as most people but I have hair on my face, I have hair on my eyebrows, around my eyes, on my arms, all over. We all are covered in hair. Invertebrates are also covered in something that's like hair, but it's not exactly like a mammal type of hair, but it's similar. Our hair is made out of a different compound called keratin, and theirs is made out of something called chitin. But let's talk about how they're similar and different. So we, get input from the world around us by specialized sense organs. Um, we smell with our noses, we taste with our mouth. Now invertebrates have involved hair, specialized hairs that help them with those functions. Let's look at a few that I brought today. So I brought some tarantulas, first of all, as we all know, tarantulas are just coated in hairs, right? They're some of the hairiest things we can think of. This is one of our tarantulas that we named Green Bean, though she's actually covered in pink hair. We were being silly when we named her Green Bean. She's called a pink-toed tarantula. Now, as a pink-toed tarantula, she uses these hairs in all kinds of ways. One of the ways that she uses it is for defense. And so a tarantula has a defense mechanism, right? We all know that they're big and that they have fangs, but they can actually take the hairs that are on their body and with their hairy leg, flick the hairs off of their body. We can look at a picture of some of these hairs. They're called urticating hairs and they're actually barbed. And so you see the center piece of hair has all of these other pieces come up, coming off of it. Those are called barbs. And so as they get thrown off, they'll get wedged into whatever they land on. And it's really hard to get them out because of all these barbs go in deep. And then as you try to pull them out, the barbs are facing the other direction. So then they get stuck in the skin or the mouth or the eyes of whatever they flick their hairs onto. Now, after a tarantula has flicked these hairs off, the hairs create, the space where the hairs were, create a bald spot. Here's a tarantula who's flicked off most of her hairs, creating this weird bald patch. But, right, we all know that a tarantula can molt. We've learned about that before. And so when a tarantula molts, they actually regenerate all of those hairs so that they can continue that defensive mechanism of throwing hairs. Another way that tarantula uses all these hairs is as a warning coloration. So can you see the bottom of her, that red patch? That's where her fangs are. 
And that red patch is a warning. Um, be careful because I have these giant fangs and you don't want to get bit. And so they use colors, different colors of hair to signal as a warning. Uh, be careful because nature understands that those colors um, are dangerous. I have another tarantula here. This is called a cobalt blue. And I'm having a hard time showing the colors on the camera, but I can show you this picture of her. This is what she looks like. So she is a cobalt blue. And some recent studies show that cobalt blues actually use their coloration to detect each other. So previously it was thought that tarantulas couldn't see very well at all and they certainly couldn't see color, but some evidence is starting to show that they can detect each other. So the ones that have these mesmerizing blue and purple colors might be able to detect one another's colors in order for uh, kinship and mate recognition. Let me see if I can use another type of light. See if we can get her to show up a little bit more of her blue color. See it, right? So this is a cobalt blue. She's from about Southeast Asia region, whereas our pink toe tarantula here is from uh, Central America. There you can really see her, her warning coloration here right ne next to her fangs. And so a tarantula will rear up on her hind legs in order to say, hey, <clears throat> don't mess with me because I have these gigantic things as a defense mechanism. Now they also use their hairs to sense uh, vibrations when they're down in their burrows. They can sense uh, what's going on in their environment through all of these sensory hairs, relays information to their nervous system as to um, what they can smell in the environment, if something's coming towards them or away from them by the vibrations that the air gives off. <clears throat> Another type of spider, it's much smaller than the tarantula. You've probably seen them in your house, maybe even your kitchen or your bathroom or your yard, are the jumping spiders. And so this is a jumping spider. You see she's on top of the glass. They can also use hairs on the bottom of their feet to walk on a very slick surface like glass or plastic. And so their bottom of their feet are coated with hairs like this. And so each one of these hairs in, uh, adds surface area for them to hold on to. And so it's like having a whole bunch of feet on one foot, right? All spiders have eight feet. And then you add in a uh, hundred thousand hairs that turns into a whole lot of feet. Um, we call that sure-footedness. And so they certainly are sure-footed. There's a picture of a of one that's standing upside down holding on to something. This looks like something that's not slick, right? That's a leaf or a piece of tree, but it doesn't matter. They can even stand really easily upside down. Another way that, that jumping spiders use their hairs is for communication with each other. So jumping spiders can see really, really well. They have excellent vision. And so they can see in all these other colors of the spectrum, colors that we can't even detect because they have specialized uh, structures inside their eyes to see other colors that are out there. And so <clears throat> they can detect each other very, very well. And if we look at one of their their next picture of their eyes. So they have, right, all these different eyes. They have eyes in the front, eyes in the back, another pair on the sides, more on the top. All of that is detecting distance and colors in order for them to detect uh, what's going on in the world. Specifically, again, it's kin recognition. That means finding a mate or finding uh, another of their species. And this, the next slide is of a peacock spider. And so when a peacock spider finds, this is a male, when he finds a female, he has this whole pattern of hairs uh, on a part of his body that he flips forward and then starts doing a dance with all of these colorful hairs in order to uh, impress a female jumping spider. And the more hairs he has, the more impressive his dance is, 
the more likely is she is to be interested in him and to think that he's healthy and uh, a good mate to be around. <laughs> and so those are the peacock spiders. You might want to find a video on YouTube of their whole song and dance routine because it really is hilarious. Now, besides spiders, there are lots of other invertebrates that, that use their specialized hairs. Uh, those hairs are also called seta. That's what we call uh, invertebrate hairs. And so uh, Lepidoptera, or butterflies and moths, use hairs a lot. And most moths can't see very well. They're not like butterflies who can see really well and fly during the day. Most moths are nocturnal and they can't see very well at all, but they can smell extra, extra well. And so moths have these really feathery antenna and all those feathers or all those hairs increase the surface area for smelling. So it's like having thousands and thousands of nose, noses on their antenna in order to smell um, where they're going. And so they use their antenna to smell food, but more importantly, to smell each other. And so a male moth can detect a female moth from miles and miles away in the dark without a map, using nothing but his antenna, using nothing but his nose. And that's all because of those sensory hairs all over the antenna to help it decode smells into information in order to find a female miles away, you know, sitting on a, on a tree, hunkered down, just waiting for the, for the male to find her. Let me show you a picture of this moth. This is a moth from, from our collection. This is called an atlas moth. And you can see the antenna way up here. See how feathery they are. And then see all these other colors. So these are also hairs all over the wings. They're modified into scales, but scales are still a type of hair. And then their body is super furry and hairy down here because they are active at night and helps keep them warm in the nighttime when the temperatures drop. Another way that, that moths use all of these hairs uh, is for protection. And so you, maybe you've seen a woolly bear caterpillar. Those are the ones that are covered in these black and, and uh, brownish hairs, and they use them for protection from birds. And so, Right. If you're a bird and you have a soft palate like we do, the inside of our mouth is very soft. We don't want to bite down on something that's covered in spines and barbs and really thick hairs, right? That would be terrible. And so that's part of their protection mechanism. They'll even cool up into a tight ball in order to protect their bodies. They can also emit um, a chemical, a toxin that adds to the protection uh, that can cause um, a rash or a hive type of situation that's also oozed from the pores of their body and then gets covered all over those hairs. And we can look at what the adult woolly tiger moth caterpillar looks like and it turns into what we call a tiger moth. And you can see the body, especially up there near the head, is covered in those hairs, right? It, adds a layer of, of insulation to help keep their bodies warm at night. And then look at all the patterns of colors that you see, right? It's amazing. And then the last thing I have to show you are scorpions, right? Scorpions are also invertebrate and they have a modification on their body. We don't really think of scorpions as being super hairy, but if you look at them really, really close, you can see that they actually are covered in hairs. Even an earthworm has hairs on it that we can't detect. It's what helps an earthworm push its way uh, through the soil. And so most invertebrates, though we, they don't look particularly hairy, are usually coated in hairs um, for some sort of reason, like sensory input. So these are called pectines on the flip side of a scorpion. And pectines are these feather, feather, toothy like structures. They look kind of rigid, but if you get closer and closer and closer and really look at them up close, they're actually modified hairs as well. 
And so as a scorpion is cruising along on the sand or down in its burrow, it can't see very well either, but because it has this extra sensory perception to be able to detect vibrations and smells of the world around them um, via these pectines, they are able to, to get around and survive in the absence of vision because they have these modified hairs. And so invertebrates have all sorts of ways to sense the world via um, specialized sitae or these modified hairs <clears throat> where we use um, other sense organs. Well, I look forward to all your questions and thank you. Thanks so much, Forrest. That was so cool to see so many neat invertebrates and learn all about these cool adaptations that they have. We've had a ton of great questions from students, so I'm going to go through a couple. Um, we thank you guys for, for asking these really cool questions and wanting to learn more about all the different insects and arachnids that we've seen. Um, so some students were curious, we were talking about um, the tarantulas and the different colors that they come in, and you were explaining some of those adaptations. Sure. How is it that tarantulas like that turn those colors? How is it that they get those colors in the first place? Do we know why that is? Well, you know, it's genetically programmed in, so they've evolved these colors over millions and millions of years for some sort of survival um, advantage. And so a green tarantula usually is found in a place that's greenish. And so being green has allowed it to acquire uh, survival adaptations that they then transfer, they transfer those genes onto their offspring and those, those offspring then survive in a greenish type of world and they pass those on over and over and over again. So it is something that's uh, genetically programmed in because it has a survival advantage. There are still some mysteries though as to, you know, why are some things so amazingly colored when they they're just sticking out they're just gaudy they're just attracting attention to themselves and what we usually try to figure out is what is the selective advantage to that and usually it's mate recognition um so it allow even though they appear gaudy to us it helps them to sort out between oh you're not my species you're my species and so i'm going to find a mate that looks like me and then have offspring versus when species mate with each other and they're not the right species, they don't have offer, uh, viable offspring that then make it to the next generation. Thank you, that was a great question. That's so cool. Thank you for explaining that. Um, you explained that um, tarantulas like green bean that you have with you right there, um, they lose those hairs if they shed them off, right? And then they can grow those back after molting. Nathaniel was asking, how long does it take for a tarantula to grow back its hair after it uses those urticating hairs? And I guess, how long does it take for a molt to grow would be the question. It depends on the age of the tarantula, how well the tarantula is eating as to how often it's going to molt. And so, uh, usually it's a couple of times a year a tarantula will will molt. Um, it's less often than that if it's having a hard time getting food resources. It just doesn't have enough energy to grow a new molt. And then all the energy required to molt, um, it's pretty tricky. But it usually happens one or two times a year. And then it happens pretty quickly because they're so susceptible to being eaten during that time, right? They have to flip over on their back, wiggle out of their old exoskeleton, <clears throat> which is tricky in and of itself. You know, they have eight legs and one of their legs could get stuck in there and then they're stuck and they can't do it properly. So it has to happen pretty quickly. So it happens, you know, between <clears throat> 15 and 30 minutes for them to molt and then flip over and then harden the new exoskeleton so that they can uh, be protected again and be able to defend themselves in case something were to show up. That's such a cool adaptation. Thanks, Forrest. Um, we had a couple questions about our jumping spiders as well. Um, Nikki was asking, why do jumping spiders jump? And Kathy was wondering, how high can they jump? Do you happen to know? Oh, well, 
I can't remember what the actual number is, but they can jump so much farther than their actual body length. And what's funny is that they don't jump with their back legs, they jump with their front legs. And so when you look at a jumping spider, it's their front legs that are all muscular and that they use for, for springing. But you'd have to look up that number. It's really, really far. It's amazing how much farther they can they can jump than say we can or most things that that aren't uh, built to jump. So it's it's pretty far. <clears throat> they also, when they jump, um, they put down what's called a drag line, and so it's a piece of silk. So every time they jump, they attach a piece of silk, and then they jump. So in case they miss what it is they're trying to jump onto, they don't don't just go splat. They are attached by this drag line. So then they'll swing back and forth so they can get their footing again. It's pretty cool. That's so awesome. They're such cool little critters. Um, Edo is wondering, how do jumping spiders learn or know that dance that you were explaining, that one that's right, right. jumping spider? That's what it's what's amazing about so many most invertebrates is they don't have anybody that teaches them. Um, it's built in, it's hardwired into their system just to know how to do all these things that's so species specific. Uh, it's not taught at all. It's, it's built in. So it's hardwired. It's, uh, it's amazing, really. And, you know, they, they dance, the dance is very specific, but even drum beat like a little song that goes with their dance you really have to look it up it's so cool and I think we should do just a whole series or at least one segment on, just on jumping spiders and we can look at that we can look at that video and that dance that they do stay tuned I agree <laughs> that would be awesome I love that those are also kinds of spiders that you can find in your own yard here in Los Angeles which yeah, I think absolutely is we just, you know, we got these from outside. That's where we got these. Uh, specifically, they love the butterfly pavilion. So whenever we need a jumping spider, all we have to do is go to the butterfly pavilion and <laughs> <laughs> easy pickings. That's so cool. Um, Sarah was curious, and I don't know how you might answer this for us. So I'm kind of curious to see what your thought is. But Sarah is wondering, why do we need tarantulas? Why are they important for our general ecosystem here. Right. They're just as important part of the ecosystem as anything else is. Um, so they help keep the population relatively low of other invertebrates because they're a main predator of invertebrates. So say something that we would consider a pest species. Uh, you know, they're all about them, roaches or crickets or whatever, and other spiders. And then they're also a huge part of the food chain for larger animals. And so, you know, lizards, frogs, birds, other small uh, mammals, raccoons, possums, they all love to eat tarantulas. So, you know, they're just an integral part of the ecosystem. So cool. They are a very important part. Um, one of our students was also asking, um, Reese was asking, how old or big can a tarantula get? Right, so tarantulas can get to be a couple of decades old. That's like 20 years, uh, especially in a lab type of situation, they can live for a little bit longer than that. So they're very long lived invertebrates, one of the longest lived uh, invertebrates. <clears throat> the males don't live as long as the females do. They usually only live maybe five years at the most because they don't spend their life kind of down in a burrow sequestered and safe like a female does. They're more roaming around and uh, oftentimes getting eaten by other predators. So they can, tarantulas can live a long time. Is that the entire part of the question? Did I miss something? How, yeah, how old? And then um, we had another question about how big can they get? Oh, right. So, this isn't the biggest species, but it's close to it. But the biggest species, you know, you know how big like a, a professional basketball player's hands are? Just as big as a dinner plate, they can get about that big. So that's really big. And the, that would be the Goliath bird-eating tarantula, which we have back here in the lab. And she's also pretty ancient. She's about 20 years old. So 
maybe uh, we'll do another episode just on on our Goliath bird eating tarantula. Her name's Coco, and she's pretty amazing. We love Coco. That is so cool. Do you know if tarantulas can live anywhere in the world? Are they found on most continents, probably besides Antarctica? <laughs> They're certainly um, <clears throat> not in Antarctica, though there are a lot of invertebrates that do live in the Arctic. And they have uh, a built-in antifree, antifreeze, like we put in our cars to keep our cars from freezing. They have built-in ways to keep their bodies from freezing. But other than that, tarantulas are pretty widespread, right? We have a lot in North America, a lot in California, uh, all over Central, South America, Canada, Europe. They're pretty widespread for sure in most habitats, be it desert or jungle or an urban habitat. <clears throat> Definitely all over the place. I guess they're well adapted for lots well, of different yeah. types. Yeah. Now we had a student that was curious about how spiders um, eat their prey. Do they eat it whole or do they chew it? How would you describe how they eat their prey? Right, so they, <clears throat> first they will inject it with the venom from their, from their fangs and that will help to subdue the prey but also to digest it. So their venom has digestive enzymes because they have a kind of a, an, like an external digestion. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, The Fly where the flies also digest their food externally. And then they have these legs in the front called pedipalps. Sorry, William, <laughs> something fell. That they use to smash, smash their and crush their, their prey, which they then drink up into their body. So they, they crush it and then they drink it as a liquid back into their, in their stomach. And what's funny about their stomach is their stomach is called a sucking stomach and it's huge. It goes all the way to the abdomen, to the back of the fangs and they use their sucking stomach to suck the liquid straight into it. So it's pretty intense. It's amazing. Sounds like an interesting smoothie. <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yeah. Um, well, I have one question and I think it touches back to your presentation that you did last week during Dino Fest. One of our students was asking, were these animals alive when there were dinosaurs around? Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially tarantulas. Tarantulas are considered to be ancient. We call them old world spiders. They were some of the first to evolve on the planet. Um, and then the, some of the tarantulas started radiating out into, into other types of spiders that we see today. Right, we looked at the scorpions. Scorpions were definitely on the planet during the dino age. <clears throat> now we don't have, as far as I know, a fossil record of jumping spiders from that era, but um, so I can't answer that specifically. So it may be more like a uh, distant relative of the jumping spiders during during the dinosaurs, but. I would bet my money that jumping spiders were around during the dino age. <laughs> so cool. Meeting some, some fellow dino age animals. I love it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Forrest. And to all of our students, I'm going to go ahead and close us out of our program today, but we had so much fun exploring yeah. these fun. cool animals. Thanks, thank Forrest. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for participating. This was so much fun. I'm gonna go ahead and just close out with our last slide here. Um, all righty. So we wanna thank all of our friends and our students for joining us this morning. We learned so much about tarantulas, some jumping spiders, even about scorpions and some of their amazing adaptations. If you wanna see more of our live animal program, give them a follow on Instagram at NHMLA underscore live animals. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can even see Lunchtime with Live Animals, which happens every week as well, if you're curious to see what some of these animals eat for their lunch. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone.